Time to rise and shine. Something strange has happened to Shane and her dog. Greetings! Welcome, my friends. Welcome. Welcome to the celebration. Tis a special occasion for today's Yarn of Terror, an anniversary to be celebrated. Father's Day. Of course, it may come as a day to give recognition to all fathers in today's world, and a normal day to some. Obsolete. Another passing day of the year. Personally, I think Father's Day is unnecessary. The expectations for any type of appreciation for responsibilities never fails on being a foundation for a potential and effective horror story. A man who cannot function without a day to be thanked for his responsibilities is truly an unremitting horror waiting to happen. So our celebration is being held at the parlor of the Grantham House. Every Father's Day, Sylvia Grantham upholds a tradition of some sorts by gathering family members in a passive-aggressive celebration in regards to the passing of Nathan Grantham the former patriarch of this family, the Granthams, a miserable pedigree, where small moments of happiness can only exist after enough sips of the most finest wine. Our hostess for today's anniversary is Sylvia, and today's guest being her nephew Richard, her niece Cass, and Cass's fiancé, Hank. Surely Cass was kind enough to show the amazing wealth that comes along with the Grantham name with all her reckless spending. Money, my friends. Money. The Grantham name isn't without its wealth, and we could thank Aunt Bedelia for that. In fact, I would say that's the whole reason why we're having a celebration, to thank her for all this. Our eccentric and reclusive member of the family. She'll be joining the rest very shortly, after she pays dear old daddy a visit, of course. And that should be the great Aunt Bedelia pulling up the driveway, right on cue. Every Father's Day, 4 p.m. sharp coming with a bottle of Jack or Evan Williams. She'll be at our father's grave site for about an hour with one of her soft fits before making her way to the house and joining the others for the feast. Sad how she still feels sorry for what happened, especially after everything that's been done to her. So you want to know the story behind this tradition, the story behind the vast amounts of money that is being well spent by Sylvia, Richard, and Cass? Well, the Grantham name didn't have its honorable reputation when Nathan built his empire. Meaning that Nathan attained his fortune through means of bootlegging, fraud, extortion, gambling, murder for hire, blackmail, and plenty other illegal ways to keep the cash flowing. Unlike the other crime lords, Nathan knew how to maintain his public image in a positive light and keep his illegal methods well hidden, which explains how he managed to obtain his vast fortune. The great links Nathan went through in making sure not to have his name connected with any of his criminal activities and ensuring that the Grantham name maintained its legitimacy. On the surface, he was a man of the people. Hell, would have been a successful politician in today's world. But behind that plastic smile and selfless charm, Nathan Grantham was a cold, cruel, and ruthless monster who only had a love for his wealth and power over others. And Bedelia was the primary target of his abuse and cruelty. For 30 years, Nathan inflicted nothing but envious torment upon his daughter. Poor little Bedelia. All the servants he had, and yet, it was always Bedelia who was forced to tend to her father's needs. The abuse, the humiliation, the horrid things that happened behind doors, 30 years of this miserable hell, and how Bedelia took it all in without a fight, and how things quickly changed after Bedelia's lover came into the picture. Her fiancé who had passed away on a hunting accident weeks before the wedding. Of course, much like Bedelia, we all know that it was no accident. It was dear old daddy welcoming Bedelia's fiancé into the family. With a bang. No. As much hatred Nathan had for Bedelia, 
he just couldn't conceive of the idea of parting ways with his daughter. And things gotten worse after that tragic day. More unbearable as Nathan had aged and becoming more demanding and ruthless towards Bedelia, death was upon him, and the idea of his family inheriting the fortune had warped his aged mind, referring Bedelia, Sylvia, and all his loved ones as scheming vultures. And he wasn't wrong. There were plans of killing the old man and seizing his fortune. But I guess on one day, on a Father's Day, those plans never came to be when Bedelia would finally snap under Nathan's tyranny, hearing her father slamming his cane against the wheelchair again and again and again and again, the old man demanding for his Father's Day cake. Thirty years of being tormented by this man, living in constant fear, and yet the memories of Bedelia's fiancé's death still fresh in her mind. How she could have been happy, could have been loved, only to see her father take it all away. And twas on that day, instead of a cake, Bedelia thanked her father by smashing his head with a marble ashtray. Of course, Bedelia killing Nathan was unexpected, but had given Sylvia an opportunity to step in, bribe the right people to look the other way, pull a few strings here and there, and succeed in having Bedelia inherit her father's fortune after making his death look like an accident. Thanks to Bedelia, the Grantham fortune now belongs to everyone who holds the Grantham name, which isn't many. So, if you like, we could say that this day is an appreciation for that eccentric member of the family outside, who's probably going into one of her drunken fits right now. Poor Aunt Bedelia. All withered in age now. Even the strongest alcohol can't provide a sliver of happiness. All those years wasted away under daddy's tyranny. And how she can still hear the old man beating his cane. Again and again and again. And yet, Bedelia has nothing but regret for what she done. If her father hadn't killed Peter, if he only let her marry him, she would have still taken care of him. How she finds it repulsive watching Sylvia and the others use this day to celebrate the family fortune, and yet, even though it was Bedelia who killed her father, she's the only one who still misses him. And our drunken sob, failing to see the earth on Nathan's grave being disturbed. There's a lesson to be learned here, my friends. To be taught. You don't want to fuck with Father's Day. You see, before Bedelia smashed her father's skull with an ashtray, she was supposed to make him a cake. Nathan really wanted a cake. And what Nathan wants, Nathan always gets. And this stupid bitch still owes daddy his cake. Nathan's rotting corpse pulling itself from the grave, making his way towards Bedelia, who was shocked, frozen with terror. Bedelia, you owe daddy a cake. And he's come back to get what is rightfully his. Nathan's bony hands grasp tightly around Bedelia's neck, strangling the miserable life out of this filthy bitch for not making Daddy his cake. Daddy's come back. And no matter what, he's going to get his cake. Hmm. Looks like our dear Aunt Bedelia is a little late for the evening feast. Glazed ham. No worries. Not the first time Sylvia had to go and fetch Bedelia. Must have passed out somewhere near Nathan's grave. And seeing how Richard's too much of a coward to go out and get Bedelia, I think we all can see why Hank was more than willing to go out and find the old woman. The arrogance in the room. Maybe Hank finds it unbearable being around such upper-class snobs. Ah, but we all know that Hank is brown-nosing the old hag, worming his way into Sylvia's good graces. Even our brave addition to the family couldn't deny the creepy feeling of being outside, like a prey being stalked by an unseen predator. And when Hank found the empty bottle of Jack next to Nathan's gravestone, I guess Hank failed to see the open grave beneath him, which is how he accidentally fell in. Oh my, and that's a brand new jacket too. And as Hank tried pulling himself out of the grave, grabbing something from the mound of dirt on the side, Assuming that he was grabbing a thick branch. Oh no, my dear boy, that's no branch. Why, it's Aunt Bedelia you're pulling into the grave, falling right on top of you. And we all know how Daddy likes welcoming new people into the family. Hank, trapped because of Bedelia's stiff corpse on top of him, and a sheer terror when watching the gravestone above being pushed towards him. 
tilting. How beautiful it sounded when hearing Hank screaming being snuffed out by the sound of a gravestone falling onto him. It's Father's Day. Dear old daddy doesn't want to be late for the celebration. And it looks like he's worked himself up an appetite. Speaking of appetites, looks like the evening festivity is being spoiled for the Granthams. But let's be honest, it's not like anyone wanted to be here for one of Aunt Sylvia's morbid traditions. If Richard had his way, he'd prefer his time being well spent on other leisurely activities downtown. Then again, the Granthams wouldn't have their luxuries and spoils if it wasn't for Sylvia and that drunk recluse of a sister. And seeing how Richard and Cass are too spineless to find Richard and Bedelia, looks like it's up to our hostess to fetch the rest of the family and finally be done with this night. And Aunt Sylvia going into the kitchen, seeing if her loyal servant, Mrs. Danvers, had seen Richard or Bedelia. Instead, behind the pantry door, was Mrs. Danvers, dead and stiff. Sylvia Grantham. You were always a spoiled, rotten, greedy bitch. And how kind of you to think of your dear old daddy by gathering the family. Immediately, Nathan's corpse grabs Sylvia by the head, the old woman shrieking with terror. It's too bad that Bedelia wasn't too much of a daughter for Father's Day. But you, Sylvia, you'll do just fine in giving daddy what he wants. The screaming coming to an abrupt ending with a sharp twist and a faint whimper. Sylvia's neck being twisted, jerked, and pulled away from her useless corpse. It's Father's Day. Daddy wants his cake, and he's going to get what he wants. Oh yes, Richard and Cass hearing the screaming from the kitchen, and still too afraid to do anything about it. But no worries, tis a celebration, my friends. Nathan's corpse coming from the kitchen, greeting his guests, yes, his guests, it's Father's Day, my friends, and after seven long years, Nathan Grantham finally got what he wanted. Thanks to Sylvia, Nathan Grantham finally got his cake. <laughs> now, I would say that's quite the twisted ending. And as for Cass and Richard, well, I doubt that Nathan Grantham was the kind of man, corpse, who likes to share what is rightfully his, meaning his fortune. Let's just say Nathan ended up blowing out their candles before leaving this miserable world. Well, my friends, have I got a wonderful bedtime story for you. Especially for those who've come to embrace the warming comforts of their home. Now, don't worry. Today's bedtime story isn't about boogeymen, monster rabbits, or mutating lunkheads. Nah. Today's story is about a monster that likes to hide within the shadows of our homes. A real terror that has a long history of infiltrating the lives of the human population. Nothing more than the nasty results of our neglectful and lazy ways. Of course, we both know that the cockroach isn't some evil monster that likes to prey on humanity. Just a small living creature that's acting out of survival. But what if... One day, this misunderstood monster ends up having a peculiar taste for something other than the crudded remains of filth and trash. Meet Upson Pratt, one of the world's most successful and well-known business tycoons, and somebody who you're definitely going to take a special liking to. And right now, Mr. Pratt isn't quite happy with the fact that he just found a roach in his germ-free penthouse bastards. That's what he likes to call them when they're dead. Little bastards. You see, Mr. Pratt isn't only the rightful owner of this curious penthouse, and also the plaza that it sits on, but you can say that Mr. Pratt is also the owner of many things. Just a, enough ownership to give, just enough ownership to give someone that grand experience of having control over the city and its people. And that's the thing with Mr. Pratt. Is it aside from a life where his remarkable success was built from the long career with ruthlessness and cutthroat tactics? He's also very well known as a cruel human being who literally cannot tell the difference between a dead roach and his fellow man. To a man like Mr. Pratt, they're all bugs. Little people 
that he will always look down upon. And sure, Mr. Pratt may have paid top dollar for this unique penthouse, but finding another roach in his sterile, climate-controlled, germ-free penthouse in one of his own buildings? It's embarrassing. It's disgusting. And you can guarantee that this night, heads are going to be rolling for this huge discrepancy. George Gendron, an executive for Mr. Pratt, who's been working overtime, who should not be working overtime, by the way, is the last guy that Mr. Pratt wants to hear from right now. It's 9.30 p.m. The building has bugs. It's infested. And rather talking to the superintendent on dealing with this roach problem, instead he's stuck wasting valuable time hearing George ramble on about the Pacific Aerodyne takeover. Goddamn roaches. That's what they are. For too long, Mr. Pratt has dealt with nothing but filthy bugs that are overrunning his building, even the city itself. His city. And Mr. Pratt has finally grown tired of these filthy bugs, bottom feeders, creepers. They like to feed off of you like parasites, like George in his constant habits of working overtime, a bug that likes to make any half ass excuse to leech off every penny that he can get his filthy hands on. Norman Kastemeyer in Pacific Aerodyne is old news for Mr. Pratt. A fucking dinosaur that has absolutely no importance right now. That is, until Mr. Pratt was introduced with the most wonderful news. According to George, about an hour ago, Norman Kastemeyer had committed suicide. I guess when Norman realized that there was no way to stop the takeover, that his life was now at the mercy of Mr. Pratt, he couldn't take it, and decided to blow his brains out. Now, with Norman out of the picture, Mr. Pratt doesn't have to worry about offering the old bastard a seat on the board. I mean, sure, there was the scandal and all that, but, but it's not the first time Mr. Pratt pulled through a big deal that stinks like dead tuna. You see, it was really never about taking over Pacific Aerodyne. In fact, Mr. Pratt doesn't really care for Pacific Aerodyne. The takeover was about control, an expression of true power, to show another filthy roach what happens when you decide to stand between a man like Mr. Pratt and his goals. When you have the money, the power, you can do things like that. Norman Kastemeyer was just another tally, another filthy bug that needed to be exterminated. Carl Reynolds, another one of Mr. Pratt's filthy executives who can't even do a simple job. What's the point of a germ-free penthouse when it's not bug-proof? But having the nerve to call in from Orlando, Florida, Disneyland of all places, leaving a simple job that was done half-assed so that he could go on vacation with his wife and kids. Just another bug that needed to be squashed. There is no vacation for a roach like Carl Reynolds. You see, Mr. Pratt has had enough with these roaches, these filthy bugs. And right now, tonight, he's going to see how much Carl values his job. Because if Carl Reynolds cannot do a simple job by getting the building superintendent, Mr. White, and the exterminators to take care of this roach problem within one hour, by midnight... Carl will have no job, and next year he can take the wife and the kids to Disneyland on his fucking welfare check. Carl, George, Norman Kastemeyer, bugs, that's what they are. Filthy roaches who can never reach his level of success. Instead, they like to be sneaky. They like to creep. Because that's what they do. They creep up on you. That's why you got to squash them before they get you. 
a lot of bugs are going to be squashed tonight. Because no matter what, Mr. Pratt ain't going to have any more bugs in this building. Much like Norman, Carl and George are definitely going to be two filthy little bugs that are going to find themselves at the bottom of Mr. Pratt's shoe. Then there's Mr. White, the superintendent of this building. Of all people that Mr. Pratt despises, Mr. White happens to be the worst of them all, always greeting Mr. Pratt with that sleazy, sarcastic attitude. Got bugs again, huh, Mr. Pratt? Of course, we both know that Mr. Pratt has bugs again, seeing how he just killed a roach that would bring nightmares to any man. Except, well, there was no dead roach. You remember the huge roach that Mr. Pratt killed earlier? The ugly bastard that's now gone? That somehow it just got up and disappeared? Must have stunned it with that useless can of bug spray. Now it's alive. Hiding somewhere in this germ-free penthouse, just waiting to creep up on poor Mr. Pratt. Thankfully, Mr. White isn't the kind of guy who needed proof, nor the kind of guy who would question Mr. Pratt. In fact, it doesn't matter if Mr. Pratt's fancy penthouse has bugs or not. If Mr. Pratt says he's got bugs, then, well, he's got bugs. Which is why Mr. White was nice enough to call in the Pirelli brothers 24-hour fumigation service that would be at the plaza at around 1130 to take care of that nasty bug problem. Now, everybody knows that Mr. Pratt is quite the racist man who feels an overwhelming sense of intimidation with people like Mr. White. And Mr. White, well, he really doesn't care for any of that. The pay is good and knowing about half of the things Mr. Pratt has done Let's just say, my friends, it feels good knowing that very soon, a man like Mr. Pratt will finally be getting what's coming to him. Bugs, my friends. If you could only understand how much Mr. Pratt truly despises bugs, that the idea of a live cockroach roaming free within the safety and comforts of his home, his special penthouse, it's such an unbearable discomfort for poor Mr. Pratt. It's a mistake to underestimate a bug, because they're really good at hiding. And of all people, Mr. Pratt knows how hard it is to find a filthy bug. Even if you were to look in the darkened corners, the tight places, behind the furniture, every crack and crevice, it wouldn't matter. They're desperate and you probably won't ever find them. The trick is, either you know where to look or you get lucky. Because bugs can be very sneaky. They can even hide in plain sight. Even if you were to find a brooch, you'd be more surprised how hard it is to actually kill the damn thing. Like when Mr. Pratt sprayed the filthy bug with a full can of top grade roach killer, the damn thing was still alive. Now it's somewhere in this germ-free penthouse, creeping. But when Mr. Pratt's desperate search was interrupted by another incoming call, thinking that it was either Mr. White, George, or Carl, no, it wasn't any of them. It was the sounds of a sobbing woman. Oh, how Mr. Pratt enjoyed these glorious moments, the rewarding sweets of his cruel and unforgiving success. The weeping widow, my friends. Calling Mr. Pratt to grace him with the insults and wonderful death threats. It's like beautiful music from an angered loved one who's overwhelmed with pain and grief. And tonight, our musician for Mr. Pratt is Lenore Kastemeyer. The evil Mr. Pratt. A monster. A sick-minded human being whose death will be rejoiced by so many. Even when sharing the vivid details of how Norman blew his brains out when realizing how his life was forever ruined. Oh yes, my friends, Norman Kastemeyer. Let's just say that Mr. Pratt was glad that he did the world a favor by going out with a bang. That's how most of them went out. Some had drowned, jumped off a bridge or a building. 
There was even one who ended up killing his own family before pulling the gun on himself. That's the one that Mr. Pratt will always treasure. You see, many people will rejoice Mr. Pratt's death. The man had destroyed so many lives. In a way, much like tonight, you can say that he killed many people. Anyone who is stupid enough to give Mr. Pratt the knife before stretching out their necks. Of course, Mrs. Kastemeyer didn't really enjoy that bit of honesty. Oh no. Now she was a grieving widow who was wishing that the old monster would die very soon. Wishing that he would get cancer in the worst place, right where it hurts the most. She wished syphilis, leprosy. She would love nothing more than hearing the sounds of Mr. Pratt screaming in hell. You know, Mr. Pratt doesn't really care for these death threats. If he's heard one, he's heard them all. For his opinions on the grieving widow, the bitch could go eat a light bulb. Roaches. That's what they are. foul mouth roaches who would love nothing more than to wipe you off the face of the earth. You know, Upson Pratt had once lived in the ghetto, a home that was infested with roaches and filthy bugs during his younger years in Hell's Kitchen. That's what they do, the damn roaches. They hide. They creep up on you. Filthy bottom-feeding bugs that will prey on you during the night. That's why you gotta squash them whenever you get the chance. Because if you don't, that's how they get you. Oh, believe me, my friends. Mr. Pratt, of all people, knows what to do with a bug. Had to squash a lot of bugs to make it this far. To reach to the top and be the one to look down on the city. From this very moment forward, Mr. Pratt vows that there will not be another roach in this building or every other building that falls under the Pratt name. That this city, his city, will be cleansed from this filthy infestation. Then there came darkness. Amazing how the devil of this city holds an intense fear of darkness. Cause that's when they come out. That's when the bugs are coming out to get you. The entire floor was covered by a scattering blanket of roaches, shifting and moving everywhere. The fear of bugs, an intense panic. A unique form of horror that had driven this cruel man into desperately weeping for his pathetic life, crying out for help, making another one of them obscene 911 calls over a found bug. Sure, Mr. Pratt may be the most powerful man in this city, but when you have an entire city facing a blackout, there are obviously more important things for the police to deal with than dealing with one of Mr. Pratt's hysterical antics over a goddamn bug. Let's just say that tonight, my friends, Mr. Pratt is gonna have to deal with this bug problem on his own. George, Carl, Mr. White, Norman, the police, they're all bugs. That's what they are. Every one of them. Every damn person in this filthy city, they're behind this. They gotta be. Mr. Pratt can feel it now, the fear, the pressuring building inside his chest. That's why Mr. Pratt has to reach to the safe room, so they can't creep up on him, the creeping bastards. At least, in the safe room, at least they'll never be able to get him. And hearing the buzzing sounds of an incoming call, 1130, thank God. It had to be Mr. White, with the Pirelli brothers, just moments away from exterminating these bastards. But even before Mr. Pratt would answer to Mr. White, that was when he noticed the bed. The clean white sheets that was moving, squirming, shifting in constant motion of life. Then the cracking on the mouthpiece of the phone. They were now pouring out of the walls, the phone. And yes, even the entire bed was covered with the filthy bastards. 
the roaches. They were now everywhere. There was even the smell of foul stench that filled the air. The scent of decomposing death that was so strong that Mr. Pratt could even taste it. The fear was now becoming too much for the old man. The pressure within Mr. Pratt's chest had begun to cripple the old man. He could not only smell it, taste it, but he could now feel it. And as Mr. Pratt could do nothing more but fall into the hands of the Grim Reaper, he could hear the voice on the phone. Oh no, it wasn't Mr. White, but it was a familiar voice. A widow who wanted to share a final moment with the devil. It was Mrs. Kastemeyer who wanted Mr. Pratt to know that she wished nothing more than his death. She wanted him to die. The words that Mr. Pratt would hear within the final moments of his selfish, cruel, miserable life, repeating herself over and over and over, wishing Mr. Pratt would die. Die, Upson Pratt. Die. When they found the body of Upson Pratt in his safe room, well, let's just say that a lot of people did rejoice his anticipating demise. You know, Mr. Pratt did ruin a lot of lives, took a sadistic pleasure on using his money, power, and resources to drive men and women into taking their own lives. And most people thought that Mr. Pratt was killed, the kind of guy who's perfect for assassination or spending his final moments on looking into the barrel of a gun. No, he wasn't assassinated nor was he murdered. It was a heart attack that had taken the devil of the city. And everybody else believed that the murderer deserved something far worse. According to Mr. White and a few others who worked closely with Mr. Pratt and were the last ones to hear Mr. Pratt alive before he passed away, they were convinced that the old guy was frightened to death when he claimed that his penthouse was infected. That it was a common thing when Mr. Pratt would go through one of these episodes, you know, ranting and freaking out when assuming that there was a roach in his penthouse. Believe me, the man was utterly petrified of the little bugs. According to the investigators, there were no remains or indication that the penthouse was or ever had been infested, leaving investigators and everybody else with the idea that Mr. Pratt's obsessive madness had finally gotten the better of him. Let's just say, my friends, Mr. Pratt had destroyed a lot of lives. The kind of man who'd done some very bad things. A lot of bugs that had been squashed. And we love nothing more than to seek vengeance by giving a man like Mr. Pratt a fitting punishment. Well, my friends, that was quite the disgusting and morbid story. A fitting execution for something like Mr. Pratt. Poetic justice. Anyways, I do hope you enjoyed the story, my friends. Please. Feel free for any questions, interesting comments. If you want to be friends or you want to know what episodes I'll be doing next, best way to reach me is through my Twitter, link below. Until next time, my friends, thank you for watching the show. Ladies and gentlemen, today's show, I give you one of my favorite stories that was not only written by the ever so popular Stephen King, but a story that was inspired by another interesting story. A story that was written by one of the founding fathers of horror, H.P. Lovecraft. So today's horror show, I think we're going to go creep show with today's episode when introducing the lonesome death of Jordy Verrill, or better title in my opinion, the original title that is, Weeds. So today's story 
will be taking place in some remote part of New Hampshire, somewhere near Blueberg Creek at the rundown gas station that's off the 26. Now, honestly, I have no idea how long it's been since the gas station had seen its last customer. In fact, I have no idea how long it's been since this aged and dying relic of an off-road service station had seen any signs of life, with the exception of Jordy Verrill and his father, who ended up passing away about three years ago, so I guess that just leaves Jordy running the place. Jordy Verrill, a kind fellow, but not very bright. He's what you would call a jack-of-all-trades and a master of none. And even though many would consider Jordy as someone who isn't really the sharpest tool in the tool shed, you got to keep in mind that overall, he's a simple-minded fellow who's barely managed to hold his body and soul together, mostly because of the good old Veril luck that tends to run in the family. Until one summer night, when Jordy had just happened to look up at the midnight sky at the right moment. That, my friends, was when the luck of Jordy Verrill would experience a dramatic change for the worst. If Jordy isn't mistaken, he could have sworn that the thing he had saw from the sky had landed somewhere near Blueberg Creek, and stumbling upon the glowing wonder just hiding away within the crater. Jordy was not only right about his suspicions, but it seemed that his ambitious curiosity had him discovering what looks like a fallen meteor. Probably wasn't a smart idea when Jordy tried grabbing his newfound discovery, seeing how it's probably still scalding hot from the impact. But of course, I don't think Jordy's mind wasn't really focused on any of that science stuff, nor common sense. Nah, his mind was more focused on how much he was going to get for the meteor up at the community college. If Jordy's not mistaken, they should have something like a department of meteors or somebody up at the college who's willing to pay a fortune for this thing. You gotta admit, it is a pretty damn fine meteor. And of course, Jordy knows that they'll try to go cheap by trying to give 50 bucks for the thing. But Anita Verrill did not raise an idiot which is why he ain't going to go no less than two hundred dollars. That's right. They're going to have to keep the money counting because it's going to be two hundred dollars and not a cent less. Besides, it's Jordy's Meteor and they have no other choice but to pay his price. Two hundred or nothing. Of course, first thing Jordy's got to do is find some way to cool the damn thing off. Definitely a bucket of water or two will most likely do the trick, but when Jordy had felt the sudden sharp of pain running through his hand when his fingers dabbed the water, he was kind of surprised how the bird marks from the meteor had somehow given his fingers a nasty pair of blisters. Not that Jordy really cared, because this time, Jordy Farrell had finally got it made. Oh yeah, he could already see Mr. Bookmore's face from the bank when showing up with the $200 and finally pay off that loan. To think that Mr. Bookmore had thought that Jordy Vero couldn't pay his debts because of how good old Jordy couldn't even keep a steady job no more than two weeks. Laughing at the thought of seeing himself telling Mr. Bookmore how the bunny had just literally fell from the sky. But when such a wonderful thought was interrupted by the sounds of a sizzling crack, Jordy instantly knew that he was already in trouble when noticing how dumping the water onto the meteor had just cracked it wide open. Oh, Lunkhead Jordy had just screwed up again. He could see it now. He'll look like an idiot if he were to try and sell a broken meteor for 200 bucks. Hell, they wouldn't even give him two cents for it. Well, I guess that's Jordy Verrill for you. The kind of guy whose luck can only be spelled B-A-D. Poor old Jordy. Just when he found himself with a small fortune, and just like that, he ended up losing it. But when collecting what's left of his newfound discovery, he couldn't help but notice the strange liquid that was coming from the meteor. Warm. Slimy. What was it that Jordy called it? Oh yeah, meteor shit. Well, hopefully tomorrow morning, 
Before visiting the college, Jordy may be able to glue the meteor together, hopefully get it fixed up to where he could sell it for $200, but if I'm not mistaken, my friends. I think Jordy may have overlooked something that's more important than fixing a broken meteor. That his wandering mind hadn't noticed the instant growth of a strange life within the very crater that he was just in. That Jordy hadn't noticed how the crater had just literally disappeared. Of course it was still there, but I don't think that has any importance right now. Because whatever strange meteor shit had came from that alien rock, my friends, is definitely something that will give Jordy Verrill a night that he will never forget. And the Supreme Court of the United States of America, because of this one thing, has been damned as a... Now you gotta admit, nothing makes a summer's night more enjoyable than kicking back while enjoying a nice cold one watching whatever is on the television. Even though Jordy isn't what you would call a religious man, something like his father, for example, who was once the local reverend. I mean, Jordy still goes to church and all that, but it's not like he tends to go around preaching and ranting like his old man. It's just that, for some reason, Jordy usually finds himself watching the 24-hour live sermons they got on Channel 12. It's not that he enjoys it nor really cares for it. It's just that, it usually brings life throughout his isolated home. Maybe it's because it helps him cope with the loss of his father, or maybe it's just one of those small things that does its job of making Jordy's lonely night the most enjoyable and relaxing. Let's just say that if it's one thing that Jordy's really good at, it's being lazy. But when noticing the small patch of moss green on his fingers that got burnt by the meteor, I guess the sudden shock of what the meteor shit was doing to Jordy's hand had given our careless fellow the dwelling fear of a nightmarish experience with a local doctor. Jordy could see it right now. Doc Reese telling him that he's going to have to immediately perform a painful operation by having to cut off his fingers. Already Jordy had made one too many mistakes with the broken meteor and the last thing he needed was losing his fingers. Once again, seeing himself as a stupid lunkhead. It was when Jordy began experiencing this strange feeling in his mouth and seeing the reflection of the amazing transformation being performed on the edge of his tongue. That was when old Jordy knew that his bad luck had just gotten him in some serious trouble. It's like whatever he touches with his burnt fingers, whatever the meteor shit on his hand was doing, it was making things grow. Like when he sucked his fingers earlier, after he got burnt by the meteor, or when he had just recently touched his face. Even where his hand was resting on his father's armchair, it would grow in the exact same spot. It would just keep growing and growing. I think that was when old Jordy Verrill had just realized how much of a big mess that he got himself into. Feeling like he has no other choice but to call Doc Reese. Jordy knew that his chances of getting out of this nasty situation hadn't improved when he had got nothing but a message saying Doc Reese had went on vacation for two weeks. Oh, by the way, I think Jordy didn't understand a part of the message where Dr. Higgins from Castle Rock was filling in for Doc Reese, but oh well. So with no hospital and no hope, Jordy's dwelling fear had begun to turn into a state of panic when realizing how the meteor shit was also growing all over the house itself. It was like he had no options, no way of getting out of this bizarre nightmare. So Jordy did what Jordy thought was the best decision in a situation like this. By grabbing the strongest whiskey he had in the house and drank himself to the point where he passed out. Even though we both know that Jordy had plenty other better choices to make in a situation like this. The idea was simple. Seeing how it worked before for Jordy, which really didn't, is that when Jordy Verrill wakes up, the meteor shit and the growing would all just go away. Like waking up from a bad nightmare. confess their sins to a frail human being that cannot even forgive his own sins much less the sins of someone else
doctrines of devils doctrines of devils Jesus Christ said I hate it my Bible didn't say Jesus is coming back reading the liturgy my Bible doesn't say Jesus is coming back saying Hail Mary without the Holy Ghost there is little Could you imagine how easy our lives would be if we were to solve our problems by just sleeping it off as some bad dream? Of course, we all should know better than assuming that we would be free from our own troubles but when stepping into a new day. Because when old Jordy had finally awakened within the early hours of the following morning, instantly convincing himself that it was all just a nightmare, let's just say that he didn't expect to be woken into a world that was much greener and incredibly uncomfortable. That meteor shit had not only grew all over his upper body, but Lord Almighty was it unbearably itchy. The worst feeling Jordy had since that poison ivy he had one time. The first thing Jordy Farrell had to do was find some way to cool off the itchy. It was literally driving him insane. And just as he began filling the bathtub, that was when Jordy heard a familiar voice. It was his father's ghost in the bathroom mirror. Or maybe it was Jordy's mind trying to stop him from making another decision that he will forever regret. Trying to get Jordy to do the right thing by not getting into that tub of cool water. Trying to tell Jordy that he should know by now that it's water that it wants. And even though the intense feeling of burning and itching was putting an overwhelming discomfort onto Jordy. At least we know that somewhere in the back of Jordy's mind, that a conscious thought in the form of his father was trying to save Jordy from facing a terrible fate. Or maybe it was his father's ghost trying to get his shameful son to make at least one smart choice in his life. But I guess Jordy didn't really care for his father's advice, nor the fearful outcome of what would happen if he were to set foot into that nice, cool, relaxing bath. Besides, Jordy Verrill is already a goner. The meteor shit had already gotten to him. And as Jordy's body submerged itself into the water, feeling the itching, the discomfort being washed away by the cooling water, it was such a relieving experience that it even made poor Jordy shed an emotional tear. It amazes me how we live in a world where people can be so vulnerable into making the wrong choices. Convinced that there is absolutely no hope or better yet having no care for their welfare or even their own life when it comes to making either the right or the wrong choice. Now I always thought that good decisions are something that comes from experience. The kind of experience that comes from making bad decisions. But in Jordy's case, well, I think Anita Verrill's lucky boy hadn't really learned anything from his continuous string of bad choices. Nor is he at the point where he can afford making another decision, other than the final decision, if you know what I mean. If Jordy had just listened to his father just once in his lonely, miserable life, Jordy may have been free from this nightmarish torment may have even saved what was left of his humanity. But now, Jordy Verrill's life is hanging on a gamble, depending on that good old Verrill luck that hopefully, once in his life, he can finally do something right and be free from this unbearable torment. And just like that, the loud bang from a double-barreled shotgun, blowing away half of his head, followed by the squishy sounds of what was supposed to be Jordy's brain splattering the wall. And even though most of us may think that Jordy had finally struck that bit of good old luck that runs in his family, that he was finally free from this violent curse when his body had slumped the floor. 
Just make sure you pay attention to that miserable look on Jordy Verrill's face as he catches the morning news on Channel 12. Clear skies all day for our fellow Mainers, but a greater day for the farmers to the north, seeing how they should be expecting a lot of rain tonight. Well, my friends, I thank you for taking the time to watch today's Tale of Terror. This has been Stephen King's Weeds, also known as The Lonesome Death of Jordy Verrill within the Creepshow trade paperback comic. If you want to know what stories I'll be doing next, share your ideas, requests, or anything else, or you just want to be friends, then you can follow me on Twitter with the link below. Please feel free for any questions, comments, or any fun corrections. Until next time, thank you for watching The Horror Show. <laughs> Greetings, my friends. So I notice some of my audience are not satisfied with the tales of smelly fish and happy clowns. Oh no, some of you are just looking to be terrified when wandering through the world of YouTube. And even though this channel is a guide into the world of horror, experiencing the several areas of this darkened world because of how subjective it is, fear is subjective, and it's common that a member of my audience to witness a story and not feel anything whereas another would be experiencing a crippling fear when enjoying one of these tales of terror that I introduce. <laughs> Basically, when I'm saying, fear is an emotion. And of course, you could be the fool to tell me that you fear nothing. But I know all too well, everybody has a fear within them. And it's just a matter of time before Mickey will find that fear and give you that unremitting horror. So I wonder how many members of my audience are going to feel uncomfortable with this next tale of terror. Introduction, Juliet, a poor soul who has a crippling fear with stick bugs. Yes, they may seem creepy, but they are harmless. But for Juliet, there's something about them that gives her this dreadful feeling. The first time Juliet had came across one of these bizarre insects, that was when she felt this small stream of blood running down her leg. That was when she had her first period. Since that day and throughout her life, Juliet's life would be invaded by these bizarre insects. They would be found everywhere, at school, work, in her garden, and even outside her bedroom window. There were even days where she would find them in her room, on her food, but it was on one night where this fear would escalate when Juliet would wake up and find a stick bug trying to get inside her mouth. Even though Juliet tried explaining to her parents her situation with these stick bugs, there was something not right with these insects. Like they were trying to come after her. Unfortunately, Juliet's parents and friends didn't take her seriously. Everybody thought that she was over-exaggerating because of how she found a curious stick bug walking across her face at night, not trying to get inside her mouth. But it was a few days later, on another evening, this fear over stick bugs would bring itself to a new level of horror. It was just a quiet evening, Juliet relaxing in a warm bath, a poor girl who felt so lonely, misunderstood not knowing the true goals of these insects until that one night when a stick bug got inside her bathtub and when she was easing her troubled mind and finally achieved its goal of finding a way to get inside her. Regardless of the fact that the doctors found no stick bug inside Juliet, assuming that it must have fallen out during the incident, Juliet's phobia resulted with anxiety and severe panic attacks. Even though nobody took her seriously, she still feared that the insect was still inside her, doing something with her body. And with her parents fearing for her health, they had no choice but to move and live in a city far away from the insects. After receiving years of extensive psychological treatment for her condition, eventually Juliet made a full recovery, became happily married, and got pregnant. But on one day, when Juliet was outside of her apartment, 
enjoying her final cigarette. It was just a mere second when the insect flew by, just enough for Juliet to catch a glimpse of its wings and stick-like body. The horror creeping up her spine, trembling over the memory of that one night, and yet Juliet found comfort within the feelings of denial. It couldn't have been a stick bug. She doesn't remember seeing the insects flying. It had to be something else. Until she began researching stick bugs and found that there's a phasmid that could get any place. A phasmatodia that she could not escape from. Pregnant and once again haunted by an old fear, Juliet was hounded by panic attacks, fearing that her child's life was endangered, and regardless of her efforts of trying to tell her husband about the stick bugs, that one night when it tried to get inside her, or if it did get inside her, unfortunately, her husband, her family, nobody had taken Juliet seriously. There was no words to ease her agony. And this anxiety had also made Juliet fear that she was putting her baby at risk. And even when deciding to have an ultrasound scan, hoping to ease her stress when seeing that the child was doing okay, that maybe she was over-exaggerating, terrified over nothing. It was when Juliet noticed the nurse and her facial reaction when seeing the screen. Assuming that there was an issue with the machine, but when Juliet looked at the screen, it took a few seconds before she realized that there was nothing wrong with the machine. The horrible truth was that the fetus was covered with hundreds of stick insect offspring. It's said that fear is a lie. And I bet some of us are thinking that Juliet has nothing to fear over a stick bug. They're not as terrifying as the spiders that watches over us when we are sleeping or the cockroaches that likes to hide in our sheets at night. That maybe Juliet overreacted when she found a stick bug in her bathtub. It didn't really go inside her and the ultrasound machine was malfunctioning, having Juliet believe that her unborn child was being swarmed with insects. Could it be that this is a story of Juliet's fear getting the better of her? That after Juliet called her husband, listening to the terror in her voice, the crying and panic, it was kind of hard for her husband to take his wife seriously when being on an important business trip until she stopped answering the phone. Having to cut his trip short when worrying that something terrible happened to his wife. Coming home to find his apartment in a state of disarray, the mirrors broken, bloody hands smeared all over the wall. When Juliet's husband found her sitting on the couch, lifeless, but still showing signs of life, he could hear her screams being muffled in the faint sounds of pain because of all the stick bugs coming from her stomach up through her mouth. After all the years of being haunted, it was only a matter of time before Juliet was devoured by a ghost from the past. Even though Juliet died in front of her husband, the baby inside her had survived. But I assure you, my friends, it won't be until months later before he discovers the horror of that. But hey, that is another story for another time. Happy Thanksgiving, my friends. You know, after losing so much this year, it brings a smile to my face when seeing what I have instead of what I've lost or don't have. For what I have now, the fact that I have an audience joining me within today's Thanksgiving special is something that I am truly thankful for. As a horror YouTuber, it has not been an easy time this year. As a host of horror, 
I strive to bring something to YouTube that is sadly ignored by those who are seeking to fulfill their expectations and appetite for horror, facing the horrible reality that not everyone has the intentions of exploring the world of horror. Completely unaware how they can find themselves within a small section feeding upon mere scraps rather than venturing further into a world that is vast and full of discoveries that will do more than fill their inner need for thrills and terror. Here's a horrible reality, my friends, when deciding to be a horror channel. It's highly doubtful you'll get far on YouTube if you decide to bring a dish of green eggs and ham. However, the fact that you're now watching this, hearing these words of mine, just shows that my efforts have not went entirely unsuccessful. In fact, part of me envies you how you're about to enjoy something that is not commonly experienced by those who are on this platform, desperately seeking to satisfy this high to tickle their inner fear, completely unaware of what they are consuming because of how it's stamped by a mere name, oblivious to the fact that you are about to enjoy a grand feast. For today's tale of terror is a different kind of horror that's on the menu. And the chef of this tasty horror is from a man who isn't afraid to do his own exploring and try out something that's different. Today's feast, my friends, is from the imagination and creativity of Anthony Bourdain. Now, my friends, before we enjoy today's feast, I'm not here to scare you. I'm just here to make sure you have your fill of horror and show my appreciation and thankfulness for the friends I have joining me for this horror show Thanksgiving feast. So if you find yourself vomiting turkey or considering to go vegan, at least you'll know I warned you. Introduction Don Harrow, one of Spain's wealthiest and powerful men. There's practically nothing in this world that Don Harrow cannot buy and no door he cannot set foot in the lord of his own depressing world that consists nothing but a family of servants to tend and pamper his needs. But you see, Don Harrow has no care for companionship, never shedding a tear of sadness because of how oblivious he is to this lonely existence. This man, filled with sadness and fury because of how he's infected with a disease, consumed by a sin, a craving that should be forbidden horse meat, still enjoyed in certain parts of the world, but not as much as the old days. For Lord Harrow, there's something about horse meat that he finds to be rare, exquisite, something that has a specific taste that is not experienced when tasting beef, chicken, fish, or lamb. And yes, even though horse meat is common in Europe, it has started to become a controversial dish. And maybe it's because of this story while we no longer see horse meat on the menu. Nobody knew how it all began. When Lord Harrow's stable prize of racing horses, studs, and breeding mares ended up becoming a slaughterhouse. Regardless of Lord Harrow's inhumane fascination for the horse meat, nobody dared question the unusual appetite and behavior of the Lord. Not the stable man who killed the horses upon demand, nor the chefs who utilized their culinary expertise to please Lord Harrow with the finest dish of horse meat. To think that there are people who would consider horse meat as a substitute for beef or lamb. For Lord Harrow, horse meat being used among those who don't have the luxury of other meats was absurd, practically insulting. Only Lord Harrow knows that horse meat is far much more than that. If only the chefs were to understand the taste of horse flesh and yet they remain hindered because of their inner distaste for something that is not commonly enjoyed throughout the world, reluctant to use their artistic craft because of how horse meat has fallen under the shadow of controversy. Oh yes, Lord Harrow can see it behind the faceless expressions of the chefs and servants, the disgust they have when seeing their master savor the delicious horse eyes, saltied in the finest sauce. It even shows when tasting the flesh, soaked within seasoned juices on a porcelain plate. If only they knew the taste, these people would understand the lack of salt within the meat, how there's not enough seasoning, 
leaving Lord Harrow to find ways to perfect the dish himself. Maybe the chefs were to try some gribbiachi. Aside from Lord Harrow's struggle with the chefs having this reluctance to create that perfect dish to pleasure that inner sin, there was a growing concern in regards to the supply at the stables when noticing the fewer number of horses. Even the stableman would unintentionally show his distaste for Lord Harrow's appetite when seeking a horse that had the right definition, one with good marbling of fat. Even though the stableman tried persuading his lord with other meats on the estate, such as cattle, goat, or even lamb. But no, no, for Lord Harrow, none of those have that blissful experience, such as horse meat. Yes, there are concerns of Lord Harrow oblivious to the reality that he was eating his way through all the horses. Concerns that went ignored and kept within the thoughts of a family of obedient servants. Because they know better than to question the Lord and his appetite. Because you see, for Lord Harrow, you can't get enough. Horse meat tartar. An appetizer dish made of raw horse flesh and served with sauces, peppers, onions, and other seasonings. Pulpettes. Horse flesh that's grounded and rolled into meatballs mixed with pine nuts, grilled loin, the tongue, the brain, all mixed and seasoned with the finest ingredients and crafted with culinary expertise that money can buy, and the main dish of this exquisite dinner fit for a lord of success, a king in his own miserable kingdom, the boiled head. No, my friends, Lord Harrow was a man who did not want to see anything go to waste when it came to horse flesh. Every part of the horse's body seasoned and garnished and prepped for one of his infamous feasts. Every ounce of horse flesh being shoved into Lord Harrow's gluttonous mouth. It had gotten to the point where Lord Harrow had cared very little for the taste. The ecstasy of chewing and swallowing before shoving more of the horse flesh into his mouth. Unaware of the thick saliva mixed with bits of food running down his mouth oblivious to the wet sounds of meat being chewed and Lord Harrow's unintentional moans of pleasure that would be followed with every taste. A personal ritual that Lord Harrow enjoys the most during this dreadful feast is to have the horse's boiled head facing him as he consumes its flesh. Something that makes it feel like Lord Harrow is doing more than tasting the flesh, slowly consuming the soul of the horse and embrace the grand finale as he tears the salted skin from the horse's skull with his teeth. It wasn't long before Lord Harrow found himself facing a situation. It seems that all the horses within the stable have been used for Lord Harrow's unending appetite. Every horse, even the fowls, all taken, killed, cooked, and consumed by this man. And yet, Lord Harrow was still experiencing the overwhelming pains of hunger. This time the urges were more aggressive, more demanding. A horrible reality when realizing how his mind and body was no longer craving food, but helpless to this uncontrollable desire for horse flesh. Yes, Lord Harrow had tried fighting this sickness growing weaker by the day when denying his body the horse flesh that it so craved. Dispirited because of how desperate he was becoming, a man whose thoughts were muddled with depression, rage, and hunger when being shown the emptied stable. Until Lord Harrow happened upon a lonely horse at the far end of his stable, the only horse that was left alive. An old war horse that was in its final years unsuitable for a feast because of how the horse's meat was too old and stringy. But this disease within Lord Harrow, a craving so intense that he no longer cared for the texture of the horse flesh, and looking upon this aged horse, instead of seeing a pitiful creature on its final years, Lord Harrow saw something that would satisfy this intense hunger, which is why he gave in to these urges and requested for the old horse to be braised with fine red wine and wild mushrooms. 
Tonight, Lord Harrow will have a feast like none other. Our Lord, embracing that small moment of thankfulness, gazing upon this magnificent feast that filled his dining room table, every limb and organ of this aged horse crafted into these fine culinary works of art, proudly displayed before Lord Harrow, seasoned with red wine and wild mushrooms. Our Lord, enjoying every savoring minute of this spectacular scenery, enjoying this moment of retaining these animalistic desires as the warm saliva seep from the corners of his mouth, knowing very well that any minute now he will lose this internal struggle. Lord Harrow wants to lose. He wants to give in. Our Lord, a man of pedigree, who had lost his humanity to this morbid obsession, experiencing this inner power when seeing the horse's boiled head staring at him with its milky dead eyes. Something about the head, its expressions of horror and sadness, its pitiful look that drove the inner beast within Lord Harrow, throwing himself into the vast collection of dishes, filling his hands with as much stringy meat as he could, shoving it down his throat. At this point, it was no longer about taste, texture, nor any of that. This was something else. The head. It is important for the horse's boiled head to witness this ungodly ritual. The excitement, the tingling sensation that ran throughout Lord Harold's body, the erection he would experience when seeing the sweet juices seeping from the horse's eyes. If he didn't know better, it looked like the horse's head was shedding tears as it watched its master consume its flesh. Oh yes, an empty stable can easily be resolved. Lord Harrow, who has the wealth and power to buy more horses, replenish his stable with the finest breeds, comforting himself with the blissful thoughts of terrine, sweetbreads, even sweet meats. I know. Many of us are viewing Lord Harrow as a sick abomination, a human disease that needs to be wiped off the face of the earth because of his horrid acts. And don't fret, my friends. Justice will come for our Lord here. However, I ask you this. What makes you think that a man like Lord Harrow here is any different than the average person you see walking down the streets? How many people in this world are infected with these urges that are shunned in today's world? What if, what if I were to tell you that men like Lord Harrow are more common than you think? Understand this, my friends. Lord Harrow is a man of wealth and upper class, giving him the accessibility to indulge these morbid urges on a whim without facing any consequences from the same society that most of us try so hard to please. Lord Harrow is more than a sick-minded freak, but a shining example of what happens when humanity goes unchecked. That night, after his grand feast, Lord Harrow was about to learn something else had been watching him from the shadows. Yes, a man who has given in to these inner temptations, completely oblivious to the shadow lingering over him. A darkness that has wept at the sight of Lord Harrow's unforgiving acts of human cruelty. That night, Lord Harrow's slumber would be disturbed by a night terror, an apparition that witnessed Lord Harrow take its brothers and sisters, its family, use them to service his unending appetite. And the spirit had did nothing because of how humans like Lord Harrow are the masters of this terrible world. What? can one spirit do against the cruelty of man? These humans that ride their backs, run them for sport, and use them to kill their own kind. But Lord Harrow, in this hunger, is unnatural. It is unholy, and it must be dealt with. So what can a spirit do against this act of cruelty? This ancient spirit that seeks more than vengeance, Lord Harrow will be an example a horror story that will infect those who share the same gluttonous disease. They will experience a fear when tasting the very same horse flesh that resides within the bowels of Lord Harrow. On this night, this vengeful spirit will be reunited with that flesh once again and give this cruel world a horror story that will be known. An example of the consequences when one decides to give in to these unholy urges. 
let humanity look upon the remains of Lord Harrow, and behold the same horrors that were inflicted upon the spirit's family. I guess Lord Harrow got more than what he expected after the grand feast. <laughs> I'm also guessing many of us had our fill after today's show. You know, even though it's illegal in the United States to consume horse flesh, it is still legal to consume the flesh around certain parts of the world. I didn't know that. But after watching this, I bet many of us would think twice before trying out new foods. <laughs> and yet, here I am babbling about exploring the world of horror. To this day, nobody knew what happened to Lord Harrow on that night. Well, besides the servants who were there that night. Those who secretly overheard the agonizing screams coming from the master's bedroom kept their silence when the authorities found Lord Harrow gutted, his ribcage torn open, and most of his organs scattered throughout the master bedroom. And even though the authorities concluded Lord Harrow as a victim to a grisly murder, possibly an assassination, wisely they dismissed the horror stories that will follow his death and the evidence of what looked like a large animal coming from Don Harrow's body. And even though the authorities in the world would come to learn of Lord Harrow's horrid appetite, people were very wise to not question the aged warhorse that was found in the lonely stable, spending its final years as a grisly reminder to those who decide to follow Lord Harrow's path. An effective horror story. <laughs>